I think we're ready, Shay. All right, let's call this meeting to order. If everyone will stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Cop uh, Council has copies of the agenda before them. Are there any changes or additions, or is there a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve. Check. All those in favor? Are there any announcements this evening? I have nothing. Daniel, do you have any announcements? Okay. okay, public comment. I do know we've received some public comment via email and our town clerk is going to read that. So Sue, when you are ready. Good evening. The first one I have is from Susan Cunningham. It's, it's addressed, Madam Mayor. My name is Susan Cunningham. I live and have lived for the past 34 years in Wedgwood subdivision. We have crossed paths through the years at West High, at Schuler's fire department support events and at various Mills River events. I was on the board of Mills River Community Center for a number of years, was the secretary at Mills River Presbyterian Church for 30 years, and my daughter, Allison Ashbrook Carr, was best friends with your sister, Jennifer, in high school. I, I say all this to introduce myself to you, to you and to show you that I have been and are invested in the development of my community, my town. I was able to watch the town council meeting last night on Zoom. I ask, no, I beg you to honor Wynette Wilson's request and watch the board of adjustment meeting that was held on September 3rd. There were so many points of this meeting that were wrong. I just wanna hit a few of them now. One, surrounding properties were not properly notified, some not at all. Two. One of the community members recused, I'm sorry, one of the committee members recused herself because she had prior knowledge of the community's unrest concerning this. Nothing against her, but I would think the committee members would want all the knowledge concerning this request in order to vote properly. It's not a jury trial. Three, the petitioner perjured himself, on, I'm sorry, petitioner perjured himself on several points. Four, the meeting was held so no one else could speak on this matter. As I said before, these are just a few of the points. I asked that the town council revoke the CUP until there is a full disclosure and all parties can be heard in this manner. I, as well as many of my neighbors, have lost countless hours of sleep over this issue. In this pandemic mess, we retreat to our homes, our safe place, our solace. These actions of the adjustment board have, have, not, have not taken into account the well-being of the 36 homes in Wedgwood subdivision and at least 14 surrounding homes. Our home values have been, will be decreased as much as 10%. Who would want to buy a home near a party barn and a power, party house rental? Location, location, location. It doesn't seem to matter to the petitioner though he reluctantly put a noise curfew in his plan, that his actions have adversely affected the neighbors. There is no way to enforce this curfew since he doesn't live there and he has already, before permit, been holding events. Labor Day, starting on Thursday, the house was filled and parties ensued. Saturday night's festi festivities went on until 2 a.m. I would like for my town to stand up for me and my fellow neighbors. How can Mr. Van Oostendorf's $1.3 million property be more important than the 51 houses surrounding him that equal $11 million? If we cannot come to a resolve quickly, we have no other recourse but to retain a lawyer, which we have already spoken with, and take it to the appeals court and then bring a suit on the town. We don't want to go this route, but this board of adjustment meeting was wrong from the start. Please, please, please consider my request 
to revoke and revisit this permit when all the information and planning can be made available and not rushed through with no regard for the rest of the community. Also, I ask that you please share this request with the entire town council because this matter was not handled, handled correctly. How can a conditional use permit, permit be issued, which in all truth circumvents the planning board and zoning board changing a property from R30 to commercial in the blink of an eye? It may not be zoned commercial on the books, but the owner can use it as such for life. I would greatly appreciate hearing back from you, if nothing other than to say you received this information. I'm available to speak, with, to speak with you at any time and in any fashion, in person, by phone, text, email, if you wish. Signed, Susan Cunningham, 21 West Chip and Gile Drive, Mills River. The next um, one is from Jim Sawyer. It says, two questions for council to address. Number one, please provide an update on the timeline for sidewalks to be installed on Highway 191 near Mill River Park. Two, please provide an update on the development of the Lowe's project and specifically address the town requirements for a landscaping buffer and fencing for the areas adjacent to residential properties. Thank you, Jim Sawyer. The third one is from Betty Dorn. Dear Town Council of Mills River, I am Betty Dorn. My home and house since 2013 is located at 56 East Chippendale Drive in the Wedgwood subdivision in Mills River, North Carolina. I moved to the area in 2012 with my daughter to be close to family. This house has been such a gift. Being legally blind and not able to drive, the location made it possible for me to walk my daughter to the elementary school where I also volunteered. Nara home has become the place where the teenagers hang out. While they play their games inside, I venture out to my backyard, light a fire and enjoy the quiet. Two years ago, we had a Japanese exchange student stay with us. Her favorite thing to do was to go outside at night and marvel at the stars in the sky in the quiet with just the sounds of nature surrounding her. I tell you all of this to give you a snippet of why on August 27, 2020, I was devastated to receive a vague letter from the town of Mills River that there was a hearing in seven days to put a camp on the property at 26 Cook Lane, directly behind my house. Not knowing or understanding what this letter was referring to, I began asking neighbors what they knew. No one knew anything about a camp. I spoke with Daniel Cobb and he said I could send comments and participate in the meeting via Zoom. So I did both. The next thing I knew, the Board of Adjustment approved for a commercial business to operate seven days and nights a week, just feet from my back door. It has been many, many months since I noticed that it appeared no one was living in the house behind mine. No longer was I hearing children's laughter wafting over the fence nor seeing the nightly headlights shining in my windows. Simple indicators that someone was keeping that space safe. Now, if this business is allowed to operate, I will have multiple car headlights shining into my home every night along with slamming doors. I will have large groups of people, upwards of 150, partying behind my home with their noise blaring across the fence. I'm asking town council to review the hearing and subsequent conditional use permit approved by the board of adjustment. I'm, ask, I'm asking the town council to find a way to negate the ruling of the board of adjustment so that an equitable hearing can be held. I understand and appreciate the town council is here to, rep, to represent the voice of all residents of the town of Mills River. As someone who always votes, I ask that my voice, my vote, counts more than a non-resident property owner. I voted for you. Please now vote for me and my neighbors. With gratitude, Betty Dorn. And that's all I have. Thank you, Sue. Okay, to the consent agenda. Is there a motion that we accept the consent agenda as presented? I have one question first. Mm -hmm. Could Daniel just quickly, could you explain B to me? B 
you said? Yes. B. The ordinance is updated online after, I believe we do it quarterly, if I'm not mistaken. Um, after an ordinance is approved by the board, by this council, we send it off to American Legal Publishing, who is the, who are the folks that maintain the online system for us. And then they also, and then turn print uh, the supplements and give them back to us. For your example, Brian Kimball dropped off his book earlier. Um, that's what those are. Sue, do I, did I miss anything on that? Um, no, other, no than, other than these ordinances are already adopted. Um, so this is just a formality American legal prefers that says, yes, we put it in the book, um, but uh, it, it's already in effect. Thank you. I'll make a motion we approve the consent agenda. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, <clears throat> to the regular agenda. Tonight we have with us Representative Chuck McGrady, who has retired after how many terms? Five. Five terms. <clears throat> and we have a resolution this evening, and Sue is going to read that, I believe, Lord. from Zoom land. <laughs> Can I, should I go over there? Though? Sure. Okay. Um, a resolution honoring Chuck McGrady on his retirement from the North Carolina House of Representatives. Whereas Chuck McGrady served five terms in the North Carolina House of Representatives and has diligently served the citizens of Western North Carolina and the town of Mills River. And whereas Chuck McGrady began his career in North Carolina as executive director for the Environmental and Conservation Organization of Henderson County, served as a member of the board of directors for Henderson County Board of Social Services on the Village of Flat Rock Council, on the Henderson County Planning Board, the Asheville Airport Authority, and the Green River Community Association. And whereas, Representative McGrady also served as chair of the French Broad River Metropolitan Planning Organization on the Land and Sky Regional Council, and served on the Henderson County Board of Commissioners from 2004 until his election to the North Carolina House in 2010. And whereas, during his tenure, Representative McGrady was appointed to the Alcoholic Beverage Control Committee, Appropriations Committee, Chair, Environment, Vice Chair, Judiciary Committee, Ethics Committee, Vice Chair, and the Rules, Calendar, and Operations of the House Committees. He also served, I'm sorry, he also served on the Agriculture Committee, the Commerce and Job Development Committee, Education Committee on Universities, the Transportation Committee, and the Committees on Government, Education, Appropriations, Joint Legislative Oversight, Joint Legislative Transportation Oversight, and Joint Legislative Workforce Development System Reform Oversight. He served multiple terms on several of these committees. Whereas Representative McGrady worked tirelessly on behalf of the citizens of Western North Carolina and the town of Mills River with his accomplishments including sponsoring a number of quote unquote beer bills, allowing the freer enterprise of local breweries and being the primary architect of the historic coal ash bill passed into law in 2014. Now, therefore, the Mills River Town Council wishes to thank and honor Representative McGrady for his time, efforts and dedication and to wish him well in his future appointment to the North Carolina Board of Transportation. In witness whereof I do, by, do hereby set my hand and cause the seal of the town of Mills River to be affixed this 24th day of September, 2020. Shay T. Davis, Mayor. Thank you. Wow, uh, I, uh, that comes as a surprise. Uh, I had no, no clue. And uh, hearing all of those committees reminds me of why I retired. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I really appreciate it. Um, it means, means a lot. Uh, I was feeling badly that, you know, I, I couldn't get to your last council meeting. And, uh, and now I'm uh, a retired uh, uh, representative. But I wanted to make sure I came. And uh, Lord, uh, I, I do appreciate the the honor. It, uh, that means a lot. I'm gonna take my seat if you want to say go, anything. Go right ahead. If uh, you don't mind, uh, one thing I will, I'll take a, a Mill, Mills River mask with me. And when I actually get to a 
NCDOT meeting in real life, like maybe next month, um, I'll wear my Mills River mask as opposed to, to anything else. I have, uh, I came uh, mainly to just thank you for um, the way that the, the town has, has worked with me over the last 10 years and even before that as a county commissioner. Um, I'm, uh, uh, my, my former colleague uh, in the Senate, uh, uh, Senator Apodaca, uh, used to kid me all the time about uh, that he wishes I'd stop acting like I'm uh, in local government. And I told Tom um, that he would be better served if he spent a hell of a lot more time listening to our local government. And uh, in very few instances uh, over the last uh, 10 years, so I had to sort of pull out my inner Apodaca and act like some big wig legislator, uh, except when two local governments start fighting with each other, which a little high school around here caused a little bit of that, but you weren't involved in it. My experiences with Mills River have been uniformly positive. I've been um, lucky to, you know, we worked on boundary changes. We worked on road issues. Um, coming in tonight, um, I, I live very close to your border here. And so I, I sort of watched this town center come about. And coming in tonight, it was sort of like, oh, wow, look at all these people. Um, and uh, you, you've really created something here and I'm, I'm glad you continue to invest in it. And I, and I just really wanted to say thank you. Um, I, uh, as you all know, I've got a, a new job. It's a very much part-time, um, but it does involve a lot of money and it may be something Mills River will have some interest in. I look forward, Brian, uh, working with you. Uh, uh, DOT representatives recently haven't been attending uh, MPO and RPO's meetings. And, that will change. Um, I'm not technically the Division 14 representative, but I know where I come from. And so uh, I, my offer to you is, uh, you know, keep my telephone number handy. Um, and uh, you can get my email address off. If you don't have my private one, get it off the NCDOT site. It's now there as of today. And I look forward to working with Mills River um, in, in the coming um, weeks, years, months. Um, I'll be serving um, a four-year term and uh, maybe at that point I'm really ready for full retirement. But thank you so very much. And uh, the resolution, somebody's done some research here. So uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I remembered all that. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, she's been around. She's seen a lot of this. <laughs> thank you, I <laughs> appreciate it. And can I can I take a mask with Absolutely. me? Absolutely. Okay. You like. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You enjoyed working with you. And don't really don't hesitate. You pick transportation. No. <laughs> no stress there. Yeah, you've got a little road coming through here. You've had some discussion about. I understand. Yeah. So, uh, thanks, y'all. Thank, Thank you, appreciate sir. Appreciate it. Okay, agenda item B is the uh, memorandum, memorandum of understanding with the Henderson County CARES Act funding. Thank you, Mayor. This agreement uh, between the county and the town of Mills River uh, essentially formalizes the agreement that we have with them as far as the disbursement of uh, COVID relief funding or uh, coronavirus relief funding CRF plan that we submitted back in uh, August. Uh, the, the, as you'll note in the uh, agreement itself, the, the state was awarded $4 billion in funds, um, and then a portion of that had to be allocated to each county, and then within that, uh, each municipality within the county was entitled to a portion of those funds. The town's plan that was submitted was $61,200. Uh, the bulk of that money is going to be spent on things like uh, hand, sanit hand sanitizing stations in the park, upgrading some of the uh, facilities to um, like touchless uh, sinks and things like that. Uh, much of that work is underway. Uh, we've also purchased a number of masks and other PPE, as well as some cleaning supplies and electrostatic sprayers, which help uh, control the disinfecting a little bit more than just uh, letting it float through the air. And so this is, again, this doesn't change anything about the agreement, doesn't change anything about the reporting requirements. It simply formalizes 
um, the the process by which we go through this um, exercise with this with these funds. Um, we have submitted our first several uh, reimbursement requests, and we understand those will be in, if not this week, early next week. Uh, I recommend you uh, authorize the mayor to execute this agreement. I make a motion that we authorize the mayor to execute this this agreement as presented. All those in favor? Aye. Excuse me, I did not hear who seconded. Randy. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, item C is the Making Mills River Comprehensive Plan update, fresh off of last night's meeting. Lengthy meeting. Senator or Representative McGinn left the Zoom. Yeah, he took one. I know, but he left his mask here. Oh, that's for Roger. There you go. Okay, I got you a new mask. Give me. Sterilize it. Did you leave it here? Yeah, it's underneath that mask right there. All right. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to run through the presentation that uh, we've given to the steering committee and the planning board earlier this week, um, and we're going to run through the highlights. I'm not going to give you every single bit of data because that's that's a lot of information, but I want to make sure you understand uh, the questions that were asked, the type of questions that were asked, and some general takeaways that we've seen so far. Um, so just as a reminder, you've seen this before. Uh, I just want to uh, refresh your memories as well as anyone listening out there in cyberspace, but the comprehensive plan is a policy document. This is not regulation in and of itself. Um, the plan will likely make some recommendations or even set some policies that will help steer future regulation, but the plan itself is not regulatory um, on, its, on its own. Uh, the comprehensive plan elements, you can think of these sort of like chapters that will be in the plan, uh, natural and agricultural resources, community facilities, parks and recreation, infrastructure, economic development, transportation, housing, and land use. And these were developed with the steering committee early on in the planning process. The steering committee has been hard at work for the last several months. Uh, most recently, they, they spent a couple of meetings developing the mission, vision, values, and set of goals for the plan. Uh, so the mission statement adopted by the, uh, or recommended rather by the steering committee is that the town of Mills River strives to offer exceptional quality of life and opportunities for prosperity to its residents, property owners, and businesses. The vision also developed by your steering committee is the town of Mills River will have choices for housing, jobs, and recreation while being a community that is open to new ideas, supportive of community building efforts, and focused towards common goals. I think I forgot to share this here. Probably no one can see it. Somebody pull up your phone and make sure that's, that you can see that on Facebook or something. Please. Okay, thank you. All right, so the vision statement. Uh, devised by the steering committee is that the town of Mills River will have choices for housing, jobs, and recreation while being a community that is open to new ideas supportive of community building efforts and focused towards common goals. This will be, um, you'll see a little bit more information about this later on in the presentation. Um, we got some feedback specifically about this statement, which I'll show you. And then the values decided upon by the steering committee, which were voted on during the meeting last week. Uh, these are in alphabetical order. These are not in order of priority or uh, popularity. We just put them in alphabetical order for simplicity's sake. Connectivity and access, community preservation, health and wellness, inclusive decision-making, land stewardship, partnerships, and responsible growth. 
And lastly, the steering committee worked on a set of goals and these were borrowed from uh, part of the original incorporation effort. There was a, there was a vision statement and a set of goals adopted by this board back in 2004. And that was sort of the basis for the, for the wording of some of these goals. So these are not all entirely new. They're based on to a certain extent what was adopted about 15 years ago. Uh, so I think it's important to recognize the historical importance of that uh, as we go forward with developing the actual policies of this plan. And these two were ranked by the, by the public last week. Um, again, just a quick refresher, anticipated growth. What we're estimating is by 2045, 800 housing units, 2,500 people and 1,300 jobs. Now that, that text in green is a little funny. That is around 8.8 .8 new housing units and 1.25 jobs per week. Another way to think of that is if you multiply it by 52, that's how many you'd expect to see in a year, 52 weeks in a year. Um, that's where you get those numbers. Um, and so it's not likely we're going to see a steady stream of one house per week for the next 25 years. We'll probably see, you know, like most of crossing, that's another, that's 50, 60 units at a time, um, which this equates to about, about a 33% increase in both people and jobs. And this is specific to Mills River. Uh, some of the drivers of change that are helping us sort of put this plan in context are obviously the regional economy. Lifestyle relocation, so that's think about quality of life and what attracts people to come here. Uh, local job base is very, very important. Visitation economy is not a huge player in Mills River right now, um, but we expect it to be more and more important as the town develops and more people discover this area. And of course, national economic conditions. Uh, this was not, um, this was <laughs> pre-COVID, obviously this, this was very important and it, it will be for the foreseeable future as well when we don't know what that's gonna look like. Uh, but no doubt those will have an impact on, on Mills River and, and all of us in North Carolina. Uh, just a little bit of a snippet of the land use analysis that we did. Um, the existing land use in the town it consists of about 22% agricultural land and 22% vacant land. And the other uh, big chunk of that are small lot residentials. And that's, that's what we're considering properties under two acres would fit into that small lot category, category large, large lot is anything over two acres. Um, and agriculture was identified by properties that were in the present use value program uh, was the number one driver for which properties were selected. <clears throat> so some things that we're gonna have to talk about as we get further into this plan and actually writing some policies are potential, potential trade-offs that the, the town needs to consider. For example, Preservation and conservation, which are, are two different but similar ideas, um, are, is, is one thing to consider, but there's also some interest in new development. And so what are some ways that we can balance the fact that we want to preserve what we have, but also allow new development to, to continue to occur? Uh, and then of course, new jobs versus new housing. Um, you have to have new jobs, you have to have the new housing to support the jobs, so on and so forth. And I want to preface this conversation, I should have started with beginning with this, that no decisions have been made about anything at this point. This is all very much preliminary input. Uh, we have this, the bulk of what you're going to see tonight was, was gathered last Thursday evening. And we've not had a chance to sort through it in, in detail. I just grabbed a couple of slides for informational purposes to show you the types of questions. So nothing has been decided at this point. Um, so now I will jump into the summary of the input, which is um, basically we had, we had three meetings in the month of uh, September. We had one on the 16th and 17th, which was open to the general public. Uh, and then we had one on the 18th, which was a stakeholder meeting. And that was invitation only. And we sent invitations to basically all of the major players in the community. So the school system, first responders, economic development, business owners. Um, there's a, a rather large swath of demographics that we included in that. Uh, and we had a very good turnout for that. We had about 45 47 people register, I think, and 45 people showed up. So that was, that was good. Uh, October 1st was, again, that was last Thursday. And we had about 169, 70 people register and 127 showed up at one point or another throughout the, the, the presentation, um, which without the ability to meet in person, this is, in my opinion, a very successful avenue for public engagement. Um, I've never done anything like this from a planning point of view that was completely and fully remote. I was very pleased with the results and we got very positive feedback from uh, people who attended both the meeting in October as well as the meetings in September. 
and we use the online uh, engagement tool we've, we've mentioned before, uh, Mentimeter. This information comes from the meetings in September from the general public. Uh, this is a word cloud and the more time a word is mentioned, the larger it appears. And I thought this was fun. If you look at it, it's a rolling hill of green grass with blue sky, white clouds and the yellow sun. Can you see it? You may see it. You don't. Thanks. That's the extent of my creativity. Um, so obviously growing in, in uh, rural are very popular terms as is home and farms. Again, this is from the general public uh, presentations. Going to the stakeholder, we see that beautiful and growing are very popular terms. Rural is again as well, but not quite as popular as it was from the general public. Um, <clears throat> so now getting into the Mentimeter presentation, I think most, most of you were there, uh, but for the benefit of the public and, and anyone who wasn't able to attend, I'll just give a quick background on how this works. The first thing we did was ask people a question, and this wasn't so much to gauge uh, your civic engagement in the community, it's, it's really just to keep people interested. Uh, good, I'm glad to hear that. They do make it fun. Um, oh yeah? You gotta answer quick, you gotta answer really quickly. Um, so we asked a series of 10 questions throughout the presentation. Again, not really centered on, uh, are you paying attention to what's happening in the community? It, it was more of just a way to keep people engaged because it was a kind of fun way to, uh, to participate. And so most people, of course, got this answer correct. Um, the year of Mills Rivers Incorporation. Then we asked a series of, of sort of broad demographic questions. Um, this one I was a little bit surprised with. Uh, most people who responded to this actually heard about it from an email from the town, which is a good thing. I expected postcard to be the, the way that most folks heard because we sent one to everybody. Um, but that between email, postcard, and word of mouth were the, were the majority of the ways that people Find out about the meeting. Um, I don't know what the other is. We didn't ask people what, what that meant. And then just to have an idea of who we're talking to, and this comes into play a little bit later on when you see some of the answers, they'll be, they'll be broken out by category and I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. Um, the categories here, I am, a resident is the first one there. The one, the next one in yellow is a property owner but does not live in the town. And then a business owner in the town or a person who works in town but does not own the business. And then none of the above was uh, the most response there. This was really interesting. Um, the, the, the majority of people who attended and who responded to this question, nearly half have lived in town for more than 10 years. Um, and then it's kind of even between fewer than five years in blue and then between five and 10 years there in yellow. This was also uh, ad admittedly a little bit surprising. We were concerned with doing this fully remotely that we might miss out on some of the older population in town, um, but they were by far the, the, the largest demographic who attended the meeting and responded to the questions. I uh, should note that not everyone responded every single time, uh, but generally we have between 70 and 80 people responding to these questions. And we have had a couple of requests for papers, copies of the survey, which we will get out uh, to those folks. And then so we asked people to take a look at this vision statement, and then we asked them to rank, them on a rank it on a sliding scale. And how well does the vision statement reflect your priorities for the future of Mills River? The, the highest score is five, which would be everyone completely agreeing with it. Uh, so this scored 4.1, which is a pretty strong correlation between people agreeing with that statement. Um, and this is an average, a weighted average of those scores. We do have every individual score that was submitted. Uh, but again, that's on a spreadsheet with about 2000 rows. So we didn't want to present that. We just wanted to give you the, the summary of it. Any questions so far? Danielle, I was just going to suggest that you explain the little blue mountain behind. Oh, yes. Uh, the, so you see beginning just left of the number 4.1, it starts to, the, the, the bell curve, if you will, begins to go up. 
Um, and you'll see that spread throughout the different answers as we go. The taller that is, the more responses came in that way, which in this case indicates that most people rank this um, above a four, otherwise the curve would have started earlier down the line. Um, so pay attention to that as we go. So going back to the goals that we presented, um, that you saw in the introduction, uh, we asked the, the folks who attended to rank these goals and, and not surprisingly, the first, the first three all deal with preservation and protection of open space in some form or fashion. That's been by far the strongest sentiment we've heard from, from everybody who's been involved in this process. Um, and um, so again, not a, not a big surprise that that ranked as high as it did. Uh, can you guys read that from the TV screen? Like, This is where the demographics really get interesting. So the reason we asked those at the beginning was in part because we wanted to know who, who was attending, uh, but also because we wanted to ask a couple of questions like this and get some breakdown based on category. So in, to the extent something is missing in town, what businesses and services are missing? And those at the bottom, the first one to the far left is retail at 21%. Tourism is at 5% and then industry is at four. Moving to the right at 11% is office and professional. The tallest one there at 33% is restaurants and 20% is recreation and 6% is other. And so this was interesting uh, because you can see um, not a big surprise that restaurants being the number one, that was very popular sentiment from the survey last year as well. Um, but what I think is interesting about this is you can see that the, the demographics, how they're broken down. Um, we didn't have a lot of folks under 35, but you notice they didn't vote for anything uh, on those five, four or 6%. Um, so again, not, not terribly surprising on this one. And these short answer questions, they only show 12 on a slide. Um, but in reality, when we were doing this presentation, these answers scroll as they come in. And so for this question in particular, we had 231 responses. Um, and uh, Green Waves was very popular. Uh, hiking trail, something like that was a very popular answer. Uh, restaurants was very popular. Um, and then of course, farms showed up uh, several times. <clears throat> so going back to that quiz function, um, part of the way that we were hoping to keep people engaged was this happens in real time as you're, as you're doing the presentation. And so those, those bars are actually moving around um, and it's just a leaderboard, uh, nothing too, nothing too uh, enlightening about it other than we saw that Mr. Venture there, the Black Spade did very well. <clears throat> now, and this, I thought this particular set of questions was very interesting. We asked people to identify how much of their tax bill in terms of a percentage is going to pay for the following services. Um, and, and what is um, kind of interesting about this is they got the order of expenses correct. So Mills River is the largest uh, uh, expense on the tax bill, was our fire department. Administration and others, a little bit of a caveat there because in the other category, we included things like economic development uh, tax collections, like the cost of the bills and that sort of thing, the library. So we lumped a few things in there. Even so, it, it is the, the most um, expensive, if you will, uh, on the tax bill, followed by police law enforcement, parks and recreation, planning and zoning and streetlights. So again, those are in the correct order. But if you look at the percentages versus what the perception was versus what is reality, the numbers are very different. Um, as you guys know, the, the Mills River tax rate is eight cents and the the fire department is 11 cents. So that that's obvious that that would get a larger portion of, of the tax revenue that's coming in. And again, the administration slash other uh, is, a, is a breakdown of other several other things, which is, you'll see in just a moment. Uh, Parks and recreation uh, was listed at 14%. It's actually only about 8%. And then planning and zoning was 14, which is only about 3.7%. Uh, and then streetlights are a very small percentage of the, of the, of the bill, the revenue. Um, so we did provide an example of this because we wanted to get people thinking about it's one thing to look at percentages of what, is it, what does it actually mean in terms of a tax bill and a property. 
So this is an example we provided at a $250,000 valuation, the tax bill be $475, and that's how it's broken down. Tax collection at 31 cents, the library 89 cents, and then all the way going down to the, the fire department at $275.50. And the brackets at the top of the image there are the other are the the other um, uh, categories that we lumped in with administration. It just got to be too many words on the screen, and the text was too small to include every single one. So we intentionally asked that question before this question because we wanted people in the mindset of, well, when I pay my tax bill, it's actually going to something. It's not just going to the government. It's, it's, it's going to pay for services. And so we asked if they had $100, how would, how would they be allocated um, for, for recreational facilities in town? And, and AVE multi-use trails at the very top there, um, it's equivalent to $25 out of 100 being spent on, on that particular amenity. And then second to that is unpaved walking trails and bike trails, hiking trails rather. Um, so, um, that was a little bit surprising that those ranked the two highest ones. Um, not surprising in a bad way, just not, not quite what I expected. And then um, additional facilities within our existing park programming, and then uh, about 15 bucks going towards uh, new park locations outside of, of Mills River Park. And again, it, these are only 12 of the 100, and, excuse me, 214 responses we got. Um, we, we know, we knew going into this that preservation of the rural character of Mills River was very important. So we asked specifically, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? What is it that you want to preserve? Um, and, and not surprisingly, open space, farms, agriculture, um, all those are very popular responses. And again, those are 12 out of 214. Uh, I just wanted to show you the, the, the format of the question. So knowing that agriculture was going to be a very popular answer, we, we specifically asked this question as a follow-up. What are the benefits of having farms and, and agricultural uses to the people in Mills River? Uh, and employment was very big, jobs, um, healthy food source. The word produce showed up a lot when we were asking these questions. Um, and um, preservation of basically the character of Mills River was another common sentiment throughout that. And then what does it mean to be a town? Um, we asked this question really to just kind of put it out there and what is the public thinking about in terms of a town, what does that mean? Uh, and community, I know it only shows up a few times here, it was a very popular answer. A lot of people submitted that as what it means to be a town, it's a sense of community. And then so we led them into the next question, which is what does it mean to be a great town? And the friendly and people helping each other um, was a neighborly was a very common response. Uh, the word friendly was mentioned a lot in this particular answer. And there were 134 responses to this question, which again, we've not gone through with the fine tooth comb. Uh, back to those uh, sliding scale questions, and you can see that curve uh, that Brian mentioned a moment ago was very, very much steep being uh, sloping upward on the right towards the strongly agree. This question came from the survey that was done last year, and uh, it says, I highly value natural land conservation and would support investing more public money to acquire land and conservation easements. I think that's really important because it, it, it mirrors almost identically the, the response we got last year to the, the survey about preservation of land and investing public money. I think that's a very, a very bold statement that the, that the community is making that they're willing to spend essentially tax money uh, to help preserve and conserve land. Um, and so then we, then we got into housing a little bit and I won't go into extreme depth here, just a couple of high points, uh, but getting on that left-hand side, uh, this question was asked if, um, if you would prefer how new housing concentrated in certain areas to preserve open land or spread out to preserve larger lot sizes. So kind of getting at um, people, want, we're asking if people are supportive of concentrating housing in certain areas, therefore protecting other areas from development. Uh, and the, the top vote on this one was preferring a mix of both. And the both would be smaller lot sizes as well as um, 
maintaining larger lot sizes. And again, this is broken down by how long you've lived in Mills River. Uh, but interestingly, uh, you don't see any of the uh, less than five year residents voting for um, uh, preferred concentrating housing in a certain area. Don't really know what to make of that. It's, it's not a huge sample size, but it's, 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 it's worth mentioning. This one I want you to pay close attention to. So in limited areas, I would be willing to support housing options such as the following. Townhomes, overwhelmingly popular. Behind that, lot sizes that are less than three quarters of an acre, followed by duplexes and apartments. Uh, and of course, we asked the other category. Mobile home parks, not a very popular response, uh, but there was some support for it. So again, remember this, remember this image, uh, seal it into your brain, and then we'll come back to it in a moment. So after we asked that question, we went through a series of uh, visuals and asked people to vote on whether or not they thought this was appropriate for Mills River or not. And I, and I wanna go back to this one for a moment. When we asked this question, I specifically told people, don't think about what, it, what you want right next door to you. Think about it in terms of what's appropriate for the town of Mills River, given its character and the community. What do you think would be, uh, what would you be willing to support? So these, these larger estate lots um, are, what we're defining as one unit per two to five acres and above, uh, which has very, very low density. And this is currently allowed, but it is not required in the town's code. Um, and so do you agree or disagree with this type of housing? Again, being appropriate in Mills River, not, not necessarily next door to you, but appropriate for the town. And, and, and more positive than not on this, although not overwhelmingly so, um, but it is, it is uh, much more favored than, than some of the other housing types. Uh, so from there, we went more and more dense with each question. So from the larger estate lots, we're down to single family lots, which are uh, roughly one to three acres. And these are allowed uh, in, um, in Mills River, but at a low density. An example of this would be like Mills River Crossing. Uh, those, are, those lots are on uh, just over three quarters of an acre. Um, and those are, those are common within the town. So not quite as strong as the larger estate lots on this, this agree or disagree. Uh, but if you notice again, that, that curve behind the, uh, behind the vertical, excuse me, the horizontal line is there's, there's not a lot of responses on the low end. A lot of them are kind of centered towards the, the middle um, and, then, and then upwards. So the, the, the most strongly agreed term, excuse me, oops, was 3.4 and we got 3.3. So not, not, not a big difference there. From there, we went even more dense, and we're calling this a single family village. Um, this is not possible in Mills River given, given our, our lot size requirements. Um, but this could be an example of, I don't mean this particular design, but just imagine uh, a property that is say 10 or 15 acres, and you'd concentrate the actual dwelling units uh, on maybe five or five acres of that, and you set up the, the, the remainder as preserved land, whether it be a park that's open to the the neighborhood, or it's simply conserved, maybe it's woods, uh, maybe it's farmland that's preserved. Um, so the idea here is you would concentrate the housing in a smaller, physically smaller portion of the land, thus leaving more land uh, preserved or conserved. Uh, and, and now we drop down below three. So uh, more disagree with this than agree with it. And you can see that um, there was a lot of votes towards the lower end, uh, one, one to two responses. Um, but en enough throughout the rest of the, the curve there to, to bring it up to a 2.3. So it's not a huge difference between the other ones. It's, again, we went from 3.4 to 3.3 to 2.3. Um, so this is not an outright, we don't agree with this, just not a very strong sense of agreement at all, really. It's, it's more of sort of neutral. Uh, and then townhomes. So I mentioned a moment ago to remember that image where we asked people about townhomes and be willing to support it. And that was something like um, 56 of the respondents, I think, said that that was their preferred, to be willing to support that the most. This, these are roughly six to 12 units per acre. Um, and this is not possible in Mills River given the, uh, the density requirements and lot sizes that we, ha that we have on the books right now. Um, so when you get to this slide, it's, it's not incredibly popular though. Um, it's closer to the middle of the road, um, but, but more negative than, or more disagreement than, than agree. Um, so it, this is interesting to me, if you look back at that type of housing that people support, 
townhomes ranked very high. Um, so one sort of uh, off the cuff response to this is perhaps people had a different image of a townhome in their mind when they when they voted for it, but then they see this and they think, oh, I don't like that. I don't want that in Mills River. Um, and so they're, they're not in strong agreement for it. Uh, and then going to the most dense, we have uh, multifamily, which are just traditionally uh, rental units and apartments, uh, although they could be condominiums. Uh, this is not allowed in Mills River right now. This is the most dense uh, type of development that we would likely see uh, within the region. Um, and not very popular, but not, uh, not far off from any of the other responses either. Um, so I think the key takeaway here is people are supportive of certain housing types and what I gather from this is they need to be strategically placed. So there needs to be a certain areas in town where certain types of densities and designs are allowed uh, in other areas that you would have the larger estate lots, for example. Um, so there's no, there's no sense, um, it would make no sense to just put a blanket ordinance in place that says any density is allowed anywhere. Um, th that doesn't make sense for a number of reasons, notwithstanding the, the, the market forces. So really what this says to us is from a, from a planning point of view is this is not a, um, a no to apartments. It's just uh, they need to be done correctly and in the right, in the right spot in town. And then remember we asked that other category. And again, one of, of several, several dozen responses here. Uh, tiny homes was very popular. Uh, condos came up a couple times. Affordable workforce housing was, was another couple of responses. Estates came up as well um, and none. None was actually, that um, was there more than one time. Going back to the original values that were established by the steering committee, uh, we asked people to rank those. Um, and as a planner, I was of course very excited to see the first one there, responsible growth um, and then community preservation and land stewardship. Not a surprise here either, considering, uh, like I said, preservation and conservation uh, protecting the community character have been very strong themes throughout this entire conversation. Um, so not, not surprised by this. Um, and I think we've got some, some pretty solid feedback here. And if you can't read it, I'll just run through the list. First is responsible growth. The next one is community preservation and then land stewardship, connectivity and access, inclusive decision-making, health and wellness and partnerships. Uh, and what is the biggest opportunity for Mills River? Um, controlling the growth was one. Um, parks, trails, managing sprawl. Um, these, were, these were common answers that we saw. Um, managing the growth responsibly, uh, making sure that natural resources are kept in mind, that farms are remembered, agricultural users um, were very popular responses to this as well. <clears throat> And then the final thoughts slide was really just that. It was an opportunity for people to submit any comments that they wanted to make about the presentation, about any outstanding questions they had, any feedback they wanted to provide. Uh, and we got, we got 40 responses for this. Um, many of them were um, positive feedback about the experience of using this, this presentation uh, format in a virtual meeting. Um, so again, I haven't gone through these with a fine tooth comb, so I don't know if there's any particular themes that came that have come out of it, but we did get some positive feedback from regarding the, the platform, which we were happy to see. Uh, moving forward, any questions on the summary before I continue? Okay. Moving forward, we've got uh, several meetings in front of us. Uh, the month of October is really dedicated towards providing the same summary that you saw uh, to each of the town's various boards and committees. So we saw the, the planning board on Tuesday we had the steering committee last night. We've got council tonight. Next week, we have the agricultural advisory committee. Parks and recreation there is in italics with an asterisk because that's tentative. They're working on the um, parks and recreation master plan and might need that meeting for uh, some, some, some input. So we might need to reschedule that one. But otherwise, everything else is on track to uh, for summary presentations this month. Next month, we're really going to get into working on the text. And that's where we're going to start talking about the actual policies uh, that we need that need to be developed and presented to the steering committee for review. And so the month of November and December are going to be a lot of back and forth with the steering committee. Um, 
of, in terms of drafting policies, wordsmithing those policies, fixing grammar, all those sorts of things you get into when you're actually writing the policies themselves. Uh, moving into next year, uh, we plan to come back to you all as a board formally on the 14th at your meeting and give you uh, an overview of the plan itself. This won't be a final document, but it'll be uh, fairly well um, along in the process. And just to give you a refresher and a primer of what's to come. And then we have tentatively placed in here January 28th, which is the visioning session, but we've not discussed that at all. This was just based on last year it was near the end of the month. And so we looked at the calendar and this is near the end of the month, but we can talk about that at a later date. Um, and then the month of February is where we're gonna present um, basically our preliminary final draft, if you will. It, it'll all be put together. We'll have, a, we'll have a document in hand, at least digitally. I'm not sure if we'll be in person yet, um, but we're gonna present that to the steering, excuse me, the planning board, and then to the steering committee um, in February. And then we're gonna give you all as a body, the steering committee and the planning board and the public an opportunity to provide feedback throughout the month of February. And then we plan to take the month of March to incorporate any anything and everything that came of that public comment period, whether it's um, you know revising the way that a sentence is written, maybe a graphic people don't just don't quite understand, those sorts of things. And then we'll present the final draft to the planning board on April 6th, which is their first meeting in, in April. Um, and, and again, that's once it gets to that point, hopefully the planning board will have been engaged enough to, to be able to review this pretty quickly because they'll have seen it a couple of times. Uh, but it's, it's within their purview. If they have questions about it, it, it can stay at that level uh, for a period of time. And then once they make a recommendation, it'll come to you all as a body for formal adoption. Uh, and again, when it, when it gets here, uh, you, can, you can review it and adopt it in one night or you can spend a couple of nights on it, whatever whatever is appropriate based on your level of comfort and, and whatever questions you may have. And that's it. And that's it for the summary presentation. Are there any questions about anything I mentioned, substance or schedule or anything like that? I have a question for you. If someone wants to participate and maybe they missed the meeting mm -hmm. online, is there an opportunity for them still to make comments or to go through those questions and Absolutely. have a chance to provide that input? If so, could you, I mean, explain to them if somebody's watching, they want to know. Yes. Yes. If they go to makingmillsriver.com and then click on the, or hover over the about tab. There is at the bottom of that, there's a link for presentations and you click on that link and you can view the presentations from September as well as the meetings from last week. Um, and you can provide feedback for those. Those links are still active. And if there's any just general questions or feedback or comments, emailing them to, to planning at millsriver.org is, is really the best bet. And they can also email me at daniel.cobb at millsriver.org. Um, the planning email address is going to our consultant, Alan Steinbeck, um, who's going to help us uh, keep this on track and keep tabs on what's coming in the door. So Daniel, is that is that if I read the the the, the slide, is that the majority of the respondents are sixty five and older? That's correct. Well, is that what is that a a couple of comments that I've heard is that being almost in the sixty five year old age range mm -hmm. is that some of these people is that they don't do the web stuff right they don't do the email stuff mm -hmm. and so this 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 one woman called me and so she said roger she said when dot was doing 191 mm -hmm. is that they had you know the yeah the big maps and everything yeah the the maps and so i said okay she said i understand the virus stuff she mm -hmm. said but she said, is that I would like to comment, but she said, I don't want to get out of my house. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid to call. She said, I don't do the email and so forth. So is that, is that I appreciate, is that you guys doing the uh, postcard thing? Mm -hmm. But is that how, is that how do we reach I'm gonna call them older mm -hmm. residents before it gets too far along. 
Right. Is that fair? It's oh, it's absolutely fair. Yeah, and that's that's one of the challenges, and with with land use planning in general, unfortunately, is. You, you can't get to everybody, so you want to reach as many as you can. And in order to do that, you have to, to provide as many avenues as possible. Yeah. Um, most of the time nowadays, like you said, it's, it's online, uh, considering the, the virus ramifications. We have, we have a draft of this in paper form. It's not finalized yet because we want to make it. Some of this stuff was designed to be done on your phone, so we have to sort of translate it into a paper form. But we'll have that available. Um, we can, we'll send a press release out to the local newspapers to encourage people to request those from us so that we can send them to them directly and they can send them back. Um, and we'll also have some available in town hall. So if someone didn't want to mess with uh, having it mailed to them or whatever, they can come by the building and, and, and fill it out. And that's not done yet, but we will, we'll, we will make an announcement as soon as that's available. You're welcome. Daniel, one other thing, uh, kind of piggybacking on what Brian said, uh, this is not policy. Anything we come up with in this plan is. Can you expound on that? Maybe somebody that's watching it doesn't understand, thinking we're making all this is the policy of Mills River. Right. So what we're doing right now, there's there's a couple different components. We have the land use analysis that will be conducted last spring and over the summer, which I touched briefly on about the, the vacant land and the agricultural space. That's sort of an existing conditions assessment of where we are in, in this date and time. Um, that information was fed into those questions that we asked people on the Mentimeter presentation to get some, some input on based on uh, the reality of the land of, of the assessment, which is we have this much amount of vacant land, farmland, et cetera. Um, the, in, the information, so that was one component. The next component was the public input, which we conducted in the month of September and October. Um, and we have not gone through that um, in, in, in detail yet. There's, there's, like I said, there's several thousand rows of it in Excel that we need to, we need to dig through. But that's just a, uh, a data analysis and summary of what we've heard. That doesn't mean that anything that is in there uh, is gospel. Um, it's, it will be presented back to each of the committees like we're doing this evening. Uh, and then when the steering committee begins to review the policy, they'll take that input into consideration when they're drafting, drafting actual text for the plan. And that plan itself is a policy document. That does not mean it has to be followed to the letter. Um, if council approves the plan, but for some reason just didn't like one of the, the goals laid out, there's nothing wrong with, with simply ignoring that or even coming back in a year or two or three and just saying, we wanna get rid of that altogether. Um, where the, the rubber meets the road, so to speak, with regards to development is, is changes in zoning regulations or zoning districts, something like that. That won't happen un, until after this comprehensive plan is developed. I mean, we might get some changes along the way um, with, you know, someone might come in with a project idea between now and then and say, I wanna rezone my property to this. That's, that's completely independent of this, of this planning process. So once this process is wrapped up, we'll have a roadmap, if you will, of, of where we want to be in the next 20 years and a recommendation from that that policy, again, which you all will approve ultimately, might be something like we want to ex encourage preservation of open space. And so we're going to recommend in the plan that the town set up a fund um, that it can use to purchase open space for whether it, maybe it's conservation purposes, maybe it's for park space, something like that. That's just an example. Uh, it's not requiring us to follow through on anything in that plan. Obviously, that's why we're doing the work is because we want to follow through with it. Um, but again, this, the plan itself, what is adopted is not law, nor is it specific regulation. I'll, I'll get into a moment and, and when we get into staff updates, I've got a, a brief presentation for you. To talk about some changes to state law, which will dictate a little bit of how things um, well, it's not going to change anything in Mills River because we're already doing the work. But for other jurisdictions that don't have a comprehensive plan, they have zoning. The state law requires them to adopt a comprehensive plan by 2022. Um, we're ahead of that curve because we have a plan and we have zoning. So that's, that's not an issue. Um, but there's no other specific uh, legal requirement that this plan be, be followed. Again, that's the intention of it. But you're not breaking any rules if you don't. You're welcome. On, on, on another one of your slides, 
is that is that it talked about additional parks mm -hmm. and that was ranked very low. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> does our parks consultant is that do they do they see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll they'll have this information as well. Okay. I don't think they've seen it yet because we can get we just got it last okay. week, but they, they will certainly see it. When we first started the project, I know that we had the meetings at the fire departments mm -hmm. for public input. Mm -hmm. Do we have a comparison of what the attendance was for those meetings versus what it was online? Well, I'm saying like in total, because I think it was three, what? I'm curious. We, we do have that information. Thanks, Roger. Um, <laughs> The meeting at station three was like maybe half a dozen people and some staff and myself. The one at station three was bigger. I think the one here was the biggest. Yeah, the one here was 40 or 45 people. Um, and then there's one at station four. We had those numbers. I don't know off the top of my head, but we but, can, but also we had a number of paper surveys that were yes, for instance, at the right. We pushed the, surveys anytime, mm -hmm. each river day, yes. um, anything we attended, they mm -hmm. set up a table and push surveys. Right. That's a very important point. And, and we we borrowed from that survey for this input session, very similar questions. And that was on purpose to see if the values still match, which they did. It wasn't surprising, which was a good thing. Um, so we can get that information off the top of my head. Could we have some drop in to where people could ask questions? And so is that like the Mills River Community Bill? Mm -hmm. Maybe Boston Church. You know, is that is that what I'm after is that let's try to get as many people involved mm -hmm. as we can. Mm -hmm. Is that you will have people that say, yep. but is that if we can say, okay, District Three, mm -hmm. is that we're doing the kitchen or something up at Boston Church, mm -hmm. or you know maybe like something at High Vista. Is that do we have any plans to where we can? Uh, rent open up these facilities mm -hmm. is that i just want to make sure that no that nobody mm -hmm. is left out we, we had a lot of plans for that prior to COVID 19 and i think the the best answer i have for that is i'm going to put it back on you as district representatives to figure out where it makes sense i think it would be good for you to figure out what time and place works best for you we will help coordinate logistics and get people to come out. Again, we'll have to limit that to a number of people based on the space that we're in. But I, I think that can that can be a really good thing. And, and, and is really the preference when it comes to the planning. But again, with, with the restrictions with this disease, we this was the best option we came up with. Is it, is it the reason I mentioned that is that you have people up the Boston way mm -hmm. that may have a, a different sense of value mm -hmm. than the High Vista people or the Glens of Alberdeen mm -hmm. or, or something like Absolutely. that. And so what I'm trying to do is maybe get a mix. Mm -hmm. Said, okay, this is what the Boston people want. Mm -hmm. Maybe what the High Vista people are looking for. Mm -hmm. So is that, is that, I agree with you, is that it's up to us as council members mm -hmm. to set up a meeting at Mills River Community Building. Yep. So if you come, fine. If you don't, don't whine. I'm going to quote you on that. Um, um, one thing I, I thought of as you were saying that has escaped me. It was going to be brilliant. Um, While you're thinking of it. Uh, Go ahead. Let me say this before I forget. <laughs> I was doing a quick tally before the meeting tonight, thinking about other ways we can get people engaged. And collectively with all of your boards and advisory committees, that's over 40 people that, that are serving the town. So I, I challenge you with, along with the committee members to, to reach out to say five or 10 people. If each of you reach 10 people, that's 420 people that, that might not have been engaged otherwise. So 
I'll make that pitch to each committee as we go. But just think about that as, as you're going about your day. That if And it can be as simple as a phone call. If, if they don't want to do the survey, no problem. We can talk to them and, and write down their ideas as we go. Um, we, we can do Zoom meetings. That's, that's preferred. Uh, we are doing some in-person meetings. Usually we'll go out in the picnic shelter and sit with people so we can be in, be in, the, in the sunshine and all that. But by all means, uh, get the word out as much as you can. This is not the last opportunity for people to engage. There'll be many more opportunities along the way. This is just sort of our, our big push for structured input. Uh, but there'll be ample opportunity. Each of these meetings are public, as you know, so they'll be invited. What were you going to say, Brian? <laughs> No, no, I'm good. Okay. All right. Okay. I do want to uh, thank you for doing all that. I'm sure that you uh, have seen that presentation probably a uh, hundred times, and you probably have it memorized. And you can probably click and go through each slide without even uh, almost. <laughs> Not yet. Come so, back at the end of the month and ask me that. Yeah. Thank you for your due diligence. Well, th thank you, and I, I appreciate all your participation and your support. Um, this was a very unique year to be doing a comprehensive plan. Um, and we, we, we kept delaying the input because we were hoping that we'd be able to meet in person, but we made the decision back in, I think, August that it just wasn't gonna happen. So we had to come up with plan B. And I've been very impressed with this Mentimeter software. We purchased a license for it. Um, and so far we've seen over 200 people take advantage of it in our various meetings. And it was a $300 investment. I mean, it was a, it's a great, and honestly, you had better turnout for those meetings online than we ever did on the in-person meetings. Mm -hmm. I mean, aside from maybe the one here. Right. Those were smaller. Okay, ready to, for staff updates? Are you going to stop sharing your screen, Daniel? Sue, are you are first up. Do you have an update? Um, I'm sorry. I, I can't hear as well as I would like. Um, yes, um, very, very short. Um, I still have an opening on the Board of Adjustment. They met last month and they're meeting again this month and possibly again the next month. So uh, having that position filled um, is really important. So I need your help. Um, and um, this is normally the meeting you would see my financial dashboard, but I'm holding it for your workshop so that you'll have the information in front of you when you're making decisions. Thank you, Sue. That's all. And the update from the tax collector, Arlie. Arlie. Um, in September, we, we managed to catch up, well, almost catch up to our collection percentage from last year, um, even without Sierra Nevada paying. So um, we're at 28.77% instead of 29.67 from last year. Um, it, so collections seem to not be lagging. Um, payments are coming in daily. We've got 42 people using the coupons, which is kind of cool. Um, and I just want to put it in perspective, this collection percentage of 28, 29% from this year and last year. In 2018, at the end of September, our collection rate was like 15%. So we're well above our historical um, collection percentage the last two years. So I just I just want to reassure everybody that people are paying their taxes and the money's coming in. No, Lee, last year we had Sierra Nevada and GF Linamar. Sierra Nevada point. and GF Linamar had paid by the end of September. This year, GF Linamar had paid in September, but Sierra Nevada had not. If Sierra Nevada had paid, we'd be at almost 35% collection rate. So we'd be well above last year. Great job. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and updates from town manager. I just have one quick presentation I wanna give you. So I mentioned in an email, email earlier this week. I wanted to talk about 160D updates at your workshop in a couple of weeks. And I got a couple of questions about that. So I, I think uh, just a quick uh, primer on that and an overview will, will be helpful to everyone. Um, so last year, 
Yeah, last year was 2019. It's been a long year. Um, there was a state law change and it created this chapter called uh, 160D. So it's a new chapter in the general statutes. It combines portions of 153A and 160A. 153A is uh, directed towards county uh, operations, how, the enabling legislation essentially. 160A is municipalities. And within each of those, uh, both of them had uh, development standards, different uh, enabling legislation standards. Uh, the 160D is, pulls out the development regulations and land use um, development uh, laws and places them in the new 160D, um, which is uh, a good thing. It's gonna take some getting used to, but it, it saves you from having to go back and forth looking at, at one standard or another, depending upon where you're building. Uh, certain things that apply within the county that also apply within the, in the town, and some things don't apply in the town, but do apply in the county. Um, it's important to, to note that these are specific to development regulations, not, not anything about uh, contracting law or anything like that. That's all stays in 160A. These are development specific. And that's what I just said. <clears throat> so 160A, uh, again, maintains all of the, the general enabling legislation for municipalities. Uh, general power is what you can do as a, as a corporate body, contracting laws, boundary annexation changes, uh, types of government, council manager, uh, mayor council, those sorts of things. And then planning and regulation was previously improved, included in 160A and has since been repealed and now it's all in 160D. Um, and so I say this because over the next several months, you will begin to see um, from recommendations from the planning board to make changes to the town's uh, development regulations is required by state law. Uh, they come in a various uh, varying degrees of, of, of uh, complexity, I suppose. Uh, everything from really basic stuff, like right now in the ordinance, oftentimes you'll see a citation at the bottom of a, of a section that says uh, per NCGS 160A-383, whatever. That now has to be changed to NCGS 160D dash whatever. Um, so those are not incredibly complex, but there's a lot of them. So that'll take a little bit of time. Um, there's a little bit of changes about boards um, and, and conflicts of interest that'll have to be updated. Um, land use administration deals with the way that certain permitting activities are conducted, uh, quasi judicial versus administrative. Um, and that's some specific language about development agreements. And the list goes on. I don't want to list all of them, but there are several other changes that, that are required. Um, there, there are a set of changes that are required by state law. There are changes that have been made that can be made, but don't have to be made. And then there are things that have changed that don't need to be reflected in the ordinance per se, but um, the, the elected body, the, the organization needs to understand uh, what impacts it will have on the town. Um, these, are, these are not major, but they're just things to be aware of. Um, so just things, a quick example of, of the, the simple one I was talking about, terminology and citations. So we have to update anything in the chapter that references 160A or 153A, um, because there, is, there are some references to 153A, even though it's a county statute, there are some of those in the, in the town's code. Um, and then anything that we, uh, we call a conditional use permit uh, must be deleted and those will be called special use permits um, and then i don't know that we've ever done this but conditional rezoning um, is no longer uh, process for that has changed i believe and then the other one that's important here is that the ordinance definitions for the town's code have to mirror other state law and regulations. And basically what that is saying is the, um, the definition for a, a, a building, a dwelling or a dwelling unit or a bedroom or a sleeping unit all have to match uh, what's in the building code. And then again, there's op optional things that um, we could, in, in this instance, we should change just to make it consistent amongst the state um, is terminology. Things like administrative decision, administrative hearing, termination, et cetera. Uh, just so that those are all standard across the state. These have no impact on how things are done. They're just terminology changes. And that's the bulk of the changes that you're going to see is, is updating things, um, replacing words. They're not major 
uh, substances changes that will have to happen. Uh, a little bit of history here. This was enacted in June of 2020. The law was initially developed over the last several years. The original effective date was January 1, 2021, so about three months from now. Um, considering the impacts of COVID-19, uh, another law was passed in May. Um, that doesn't seem like it makes sense, does it? May before June. Anyway, there was another law that enacted that um, moved the effective date to August 1st. And then yet again, there was another that has pushed it back to July 1st of 2021. Now, why the effective date is August 1st of one section and then July 1st of another, I don't know, but that's what the law says. Um, so we're, we're shooting for July 1st for all the changes that have to be made. But what if we don't do them? I'm glad you asked. Um, if, you, if the town doesn't make these changes for one reason or another, um, and we missed the deadline, doesn't really, the, the, the statute police aren't gonna come get us. Uh, what it means is that the 160D is the law of the land. It already is the law of the land right now. Um, but if we don't make the changes by July 1st or August 1st, then um, it, it can cause, it'll cause confusion amongst developers, amongst us as staff and you as council, because someone will come to us with an application for say a conditional use permit. And I say, well, I know the ordinance says that, but we don't call it anymore. We call it a special use permit. Um, so it effectively um, is in place. It is in place now, but we're not required to enforce it until either July 1st or August 1st. But again, we're shooting for August 1st. So that's that. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this. It's your workshop. I just wanna give you a little bit of a primer of, of things to come. Any questions? Cool. Uh, other updates. I don't know if you saw the baseball field, but the, uh, it's very near, very near completion. The tall fence is, is just about wrapped up. The six foot fence around the perimeter is is mostly done they're they're holding a portion of it open to get the equipment in and out mostly for the sod that they were laying the sod i think is complete i was not out there today uh, but it's looking very very good um, you probably saw when you came in the park is very very busy uh, things are going well out there we're, we're maintaining our additional cleaning schedules uh, i mentioned those um, electrostatic sprayers what they do is add a static charge basically to the chemical and then when it's sprayed it, it, it adheres to something as opposed to just blowing away in the wind. So it's it's cleaner, it's a more efficient way to do it, and we're not just wasting. Uh... Yes, thank you. And uh, I'm probably forgetting a lot, but that's that's all the updates I have. A quick on the, yeah, on the public comment, knock off the easy ones. The sidewalks. Yes. That's not of our hands. That's the delayed Yes, right of way was right of way acquisition was delayed until fiscal year 2023, I believe, and construction in 2025. So three to five years. Yes, at the earliest. Okay. Then the Lowe's. Thing. Yes, the Lowe's distribution center on Banner Farm Road. They have. Was that a question about the buffering? Is that right? I can't remember. The development update, and then specifically our landscaping buffer and fencing. Oh, okay. Uh, the development update in general terms is that the, the the distribution center which issued a permit, I believe in late August, I don't remember the exact date, for 90,000 square feet of uh, distribution space uh, with uh, several loading docks. Um, it will, it is compliant with your new architectural standards, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing that go up. Initially, it was presented to us as just a plain cement building, uh, but they're using a, a new product, new to me anyway. Um, where it's basically formed concrete that will look like wood. Um, so that, that will meet the requirement of the, of the new ordinance. The landscaping and buffer areas, the, I've spoken to this gentleman prior to this and I've since gotten some more specific detailed questions, but in general terms, the, the initial question I got was, I believe on the south side of the property, maybe southwest, there are some existing trees and shrubs that are gonna be maintained and, and credited towards the buffer requirement on the north east, I believe, uh, side of the property um, up near the uh, Clement, Clement Drive. Um, they are going to remove existing vegetation and replant a buffer required, the required buffer. Um, 
I don't remember the exact species of, of plants, but that's what they're, they're going to do up there. And it is compliant with the town's code. And then a quick nutshell, you sent us all an email yes. about the, the conditional use permit. Yes. We can't revoke it as council. That's correct. So their record, only recourse is Superior what they're doing, court. their law, their lawyer and going through mm -hmm. court. Yeah, for the benefit of the public, the, the conditional use permit that was issued back in September was issued by the Board of Adjustment in a quasi-judicial setting, uh, which means that in order to appeal that decision, the the attorney for the applicant for the appellant or the appellant themselves, I suppose, would, would file a writ with Superior Court. And within that, they would they would make their case to say that in this example, I, I think what they're going to say is that the zoning administrator's determination of it as it being a camp was incorrect. Uh, it's up to the court to decide based on the facts of the case um, if that was in fact true or not. Um, and I don't know if they plan to do that. I've got some indication that they will. But I've not seen anything formal at this point. Um, and this is because, again, it's quasi judicial. If it was something different, for example, if it was uh, a bed and breakfast or a use that was allowed by right, and I, as a zoning administrator, approved the project by classifying it as something that was allowed by right and the neighbors didn't agree with that, they could file an appeal, which would go to the Board of Adjustment for a decision. Because this decision was made by the Board of Adjustment, the appeal has to go to a higher court. So that was something that was, it's in the MR30. It doesn't change the zone. It's not become a commercial zone right. property. It's just a permit. That's right. Um, with, because I had this question on something else. If the property were sell, does that permit go with the property or was that? With the property. Okay. It says with the property. Um, and another good point to make is the, the application was for an event venue of, of sorts. It was it very much resembled a bed and breakfast, but it did not meet the ordinance definition of a bed and breakfast. And that's really crucial when it comes to zoning administration is ignore what you know, you know in terms of your own perception of a bed and breakfast. You look at the ordinance and see how it's defined. And it did not meet that definition of a bed and breakfast for the specific reason that the owner was not does not reside in the residence. Uh, otherwise it's very similar. The, the next closest classification of land use would be a camp, which is what the board considered back in September. So the zoning, underlying zoning has not changed at all. Um, that's conditional use permit in, in simple terms, think about it in, in the way of town enacted zoning. When they did that, they reviewed potential uses in the district uh, by allowing a camp with a conditional use permit. At one point it was agreed upon that, yeah, that makes sense, but we need some additional oversight on it. We don't want to just park launch approve every camp in that district. And so the, the applicant in this case uh, presented an application describing it as um, an event venue, which we classify as a camp. They presented facts to the Board of Adjustment. The, the board heard those facts and based their decision on those facts and, and those facts alone, which is the appropriate way to do that. Uh, now, now, arguably, or I should say, in consideration of, of this particular type of process, it's not a very well-known process to the general public. Um, and we're working on ways to make it better understood because this is not the last time this will happen. People will, in the future, they will be called special use permits uh, across the board. Um, they'll get notice about this and they'll wanna come to the hearing and, and we'll have to make sure that um, they understand what's, what's actual uh, testimony, who actually has standing, what's expert testimony. <clears throat> the state law specifically states that homeowners can give some evidence on behalf of their um, their property, but they can't make judgments based on property value um, or, or congestion. They specifically exclude those two things. So if I want to build a bed and breakfast next to Roger's house, Roger can come to the board all day long and say, you're going to lower my property value, but it really takes a, a licensed appraiser to make that expert witness testimony. Um, and and that, so that's a little bit different threshold than what you would see in a typical um, even in the rezoning, you wouldn't have that because that's legislative, not quasi-judicial. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <clears throat> so were all the property <clears throat> owners no fat that were adjoining this property? Yes, so the, the general statute specifically outlines the process by which the public is notified of quasi-judicial hearings. And, and, and that is the property owner obviously gets noticed because it's their application and every adjoining property 
to that uh, affected property gets noticed. Now it should be noted that with these 160D changes that uh, includes properties across the road. Uh, right now, the law says that it's just the adjoining properties. And so we follow the letter of the law and, and, and notice those adjoining properties. When we incorporate the 160D changes, it will require us to notice properties across the road. The, the property was also posted, which is a requirement for that statute. Uh, it was 160A388, but it's now 160D something. Um, and we also put an advertisement in the paper, which ran for two consecutive weeks in a row. And the, uh, I know the sign goes up fairly, what, two or three weeks before It has the to go out no less than 10 days, no more than 25 days before the hearing date. And the letters? Same, yeah. st same schedule. Okay, and the letters in this case went out how far in advance of the meeting? I think they went out 10 days before the meeting. 10 days before mm -hmm. the meeting. Is <laughs> my... My problem with this, I don't like the quasi-judicial thing. I think that puts mm -hmm. the burden on the property owners that might be affected. Mm -hmm. uh, and I simply don't think 10 days is enough, even if all the property owners understood what they had to do, people to come and speak for them right. or to get an appraisal for the properties. It's simply not enough time. Mm -hmm for anybody to make uh, to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know if there's anything we can do about that, changing how, how much in advance we give mm -hmm. people notice about something like this coming up. Yeah. But it's something that I feel like we certainly need to look at. So one of the, I got that very same question the other night at the planning board about this very particular, very same case. And, and the answer that I gave to them is, we can't dictate what is quasi-judicial versus what is not. That's up to the state law. What we can do, what you can do as a council in terms of your zoning ordinance is say, we don't think camps should be allowed in our 30 district. So we're just not going to allow them. Um, but if you want to make something a conditional use, the only way to approve a conditional use permit is through a quasi-judicial setting. And typically that's your board of adjustment, although it doesn't have to be in our, in our case, so we've had some here. special use permits actually come to the town council variances go to the board of adjustment. Um, because our ordinance draws the distinction between special use permits and conditional use permits, conditional use permits go to the board of adjustment, special use permits come to this council. Um, when, when we get into the 160 D updates, we'll, we'll, we'll have that discussion. Do you want to maintain your, um, conditional use permits, will they come to this board or will they stay with the Board of Adjustment? Um, but because of the nature of the permit, state law dictates the permitting process. Um, so what you can do is, I'm just going to uh, pick on, uh, I don't know, adult bookstores. If, if you don't want to allow them, you simply don't allow them in a, in a specific district. By, by placing them under approval with a conditional use permit, by virtue of it being a conditional use permit, it has to follow a specific zoning process. And that's not up to us, that's up to state law. So is that whenever we send these letters out <clears throat> to the adjacent property owners, is it by regular mail? Mm -hmm. uh, is that, let me give you an example. Monday a week ago, I'm not knocking the post office, but mm -hmm. is that, so Monday a week ago, I went to a post office, bought a box and sent something to, to Winston-Salem. Mm -hmm. It's priority next day delivery. Mm -hmm. Paid $10 or whatever it was. Yeah. Five days later, mm -hmm. it finally got there. Mm -hmm. And so is that, is that can, can we improve our process of notifying these people? The state law says this, this, mm -hmm. and this. But is that, is that, let's don't follow state law. Is that, let's go one notch mm -hmm. above. Mm -hmm. And so is that, maybe is that we can do registered mail. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so if Roger wants to do something 
is that Roger has to bore the cost mm -hmm. of sending out the registered mail to everyone else. Right. And so I'm okay with that. Now, is that we've had in the last two meetings is that we've had three complaints. So is that what kind of options is that I know that we can't do nothing about the board of adjustments mm -hmm. is that they're on their, is that they do their own little thing. Right. So is that having heard the noise from Ms. Wilson is that do we need, this is a loaded question, is that do we need an ordinance? Do we need a rule, a regulation, a permit mm -hmm. or something? And so is that, I'm just gonna use an example, is that if Roger has a dance hall, can we, can we say, okay, at nine o'clock, on weekdays, you're done. Mm -hmm. And I say 10 o'clock on the weekends. Right. Is that, so how do we get, so I told you it's a loaded question. Is that how do we retroactively deal with this to where people in the future know that, okay, Roger has a dance hall. Mm -hmm. But he knows that if he opens it up next next year or next week, mm -hmm. is that you got to cut the music off at nine o'clock. And so is that another example is like Mills River Park. We don't allow amplified music right. unless the town council approves it. Right. So is that how do we how do yeah. we get in the middle? So let me let me go back to the notification for the quasi-judicial hearing just a second. And in, in nearly every instance of enabling legislation, which is legislation that gives us the authority to do things, you can go above and beyond. Like, um, like the rest of me. Well, let me hang on one second before I get there. For example, um, you know, there are state requirements for trap buffers in the state. Um, I'm not suggesting this, but I'm saying as an example, the town could place a stricter buffer requirement. I think it's 25 feet for a trout stream. The town could say we want it 30 feet. So we can go above and beyond what the state offers, but we can't go below it. Yeah. Um, what I don't know the answer to is in a quasi judicial setting, are we beholden to that particular notification requirement? Um, I just need to look into that. Um, um, so your question about the noise though, uh, there's, a, there's a couple ways that we can, we can look at that. I think first and foremost is we reach out to some of the neighbors who are are um, not just affected. I was gonna I was gonna say the ones who are causing the complaints, and, and I think just do the neighborly thing and just reach out and say, hey, we've we've heard some complaints about this. Do you think you can work with us a little bit on it? Um, that's that's a pretty easy first step to take. Uh, beyond that, we can we can look at the possibility of a noise ordinance that would do exactly what you're saying. That cities are allowed to do that. North Carolina have a noise ordinance in place that says. You know, after a certain time, you you can't emit so much sound or so many decibels, something to that effect. Uh, if we want to go down that road, we're going to take a little bit of time to look at the practicality of that and how it would be enforced. That's that's sort of always a, the sixty-four dollar question when it comes to noise ordinance. It's it's fairly easy to do here at the park because we you know, we're here during the day, and we can we can ask people to stop that. Um, and if people are here at night, um, we can ask them to leave because the park is not not open. Uh, and we have a very good relationship with the sheriff's office to help us keep an eye on things here. Um, so I think we certainly have the authority to do it. I think we need to start with the first easy step in talking to the people who are who are making the music. Um, and we can also work with our attorney to figure out ways that we can we can create something that's enforceable. I think that's always important to consider when you're looking at regulations, whether it be nuisance, zoning, noise, what have you. Um, you need to create something that can actually be enforced. Otherwise, it's it's yeah you're welcome <clears throat> there were conditions put on that yes. permit that 
they have to stop music after not yes yeah, so in that particular instance being a, a conditional use permit the board has authority to set conditions, conditions. and and that's what they did in that in that instance now that doesn't hold true for your everyday run of the mill um, dance barn for example you know in, in mills river mixed use you could do that uh, after securing a permit make sure your setbacks are met and all that uh, but there's nothing that would would require you to shut down by a certain time as a zoning administrator, we don't have authority to add conditions to permits, um, save for a few very minor things like we won't do your final inspection until we've, we've made sure that you've paid your review fee, you know, something like that. But as far as the actual use or, or the land, we, we can't do that on an administrative level. Um, and I, I, I should mention as well that that conditional use permit was approved. Uh, we've not approved anything as far as a development permit, though, so they're not able to be operating right now. They I just this week, I believe, I received a plan, a site plan, um, in an attempt to to achieve some of the conditions that were placed on their permit. One being uh, landscaping or fencing or something to prevent car lights from from spilling the neighbor's properties. So they they gave me a first draft of that. So just because the permit's been a the conditional use permit has been approved, they don't have any development approval yet to do anything. And so the, the complaints about things that happened prior to, I mean, we can't go back anyway and go bust up the party, but mm -hmm. those were, we don't know what they were. I, I don't know. I, I, I trust the neighbors that there was, there was something happening over there, but I don't, I don't know what it was. And, and, and we, we can't, no, we can't do anything about yeah. it right now. I mean, yeah, I, <clears throat> I think like everyone here, I was pretty alarmed to read these comments about parties and loud noise and, and music mm -hmm. going on until after 2 a.m. I mean, I, I would not be happy with that in my neighborhood. Um, so, Daniel, I, I definitely think that this has been something that's been before this council, at least as long as I've been on the council. Um, it's come up time and again, mm -hmm. what do we do about noise? Because we have some serial offenders mm -hmm. and it seems like we have some more potential serial offenders. Um, and it's gonna be, become more and more of an issue as we continue to grow. So would your recommendation be um, potentially throwing this to the planning board and asking them to come up with a recommendation, come back to us? Yeah, I think that, that, that makes sense. You know, is it? At the root of this mm -hmm. is that if you go over and talk to your neighbors, mm -hmm. saying, This is what I'm, yeah, hand them a business card and say, If you have problems, call me. Mm -hmm. Is that so? Is that I don't know whether that was done, is that it doesn't matter, yeah, but is that I agree with you, is that maybe you need to sit down with these people and say, okay, come in next Monday, mm -hmm. whatever it is, is that bring me a list of, of issues mm -hmm. and then maybe meet with the business owners yeah. and saying, this is, this is, you know, is that, so is that my, my position is, is that you handle this. And so is that if you get into a roadblock, then I think that Brian's right is that it's just fine. Is mm -hmm. that I'll draft something, mm -hmm. I'll send it to the planning board, or you know, maybe even come to us saying, is yeah. that is that if you guys don't agree, is that personally as a council member, I'm willing to step in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Part, Thank you. I was You're gonna welcome. mention to your to your point, which is entirely reasonable. Um, part of the problem that we've run into is, has been the fact that Sierra Nevada, for instance, they are now run out of Chico. They don't have local people for us to go in and, and say, hey, let's sit down in your office and talk about this. And Bold Rock, same thing. They've sold out, way. right? Uh, this property over here, um, owner doesn't live there. So it makes it it makes it tough and and I, I really feel for people who are being subjected to this kind of stuff um <clears throat> i don't know in this particular instance whether whether um or not the, the owner is going to be able to control that situation not residing on the property 
maybe they'll have a manager there. I don't know exactly what the situation is, mm -hmm. but um, I, I think we're going to have to deal with it at some point, just once and for all. Just more food for thought. There are there are development regulations you could consider um, when a venue is coming, not even a venue, but just any business coming in um, within certain districts that that are going to make noise. I mean, I'm, I'm going to pick on Bold Rock for a moment. They they have music uh, quite often, and it it echoes. And there could be building design standards that are incorporated to make sure that that is reduced. Um, you could do certain buffering requirements that would help reduce that noise. Um, so there's a couple different ways to address it. A noise ordinance is, is certainly one avenue um, that, that is uh, really straightforward. Just for you, all you new guys, is that over here in American Foods years and years ago, is that, and is that I like what you say about the neighbor thing, mm -hmm. you know, getting everybody together. Yeah. Well, what they've done American Foods on Banner Farm Road is that they emptied out their dumpsters at two or three o'clock in the morning. So people people called, and finally Jamie and I, whatever she's the town manager, we went over and met with American Foods, like real nice lady. And she said, I didn't know that it was a problem. And so she said, I'll call the dumpster people. So instead of two or three o'clock in the morning, now they've done it like at 11 or 12 in the, in the morning. So is it, I think a discussion, Daniel, is it, I think that that is the first step. Yeah, I agree. But is that, I'm like, Ron, is that having dealt with Miss Wilson, been over there on her property at 10 o'clock at night, mm -hmm. And the music just sitting there. Yeah. Boom, is that? I think that it, is that if we can't come to terms, is that I think that the council or the planning board or both of us needs needs to address this. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I'm with Brian and Roger too. I mean, I would like to see the planning board go ahead and and maybe go ahead and hash this out amongst themselves and we don't we don't necessarily have to adopt it right away we mm -hmm. can talk about it but at least go ahead and get something get them talking and something in place from them mm -hmm. uh, sooner rather than later yeah in my opinion okay any additional council comments for your last I'm the only one who hasn't spoke, so I agree with everything else said. So. Ditto. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Well, it was covered very well. So. All right. All those in favor. See Second. Two weeks. Dude, that was uh, Brian Kasky made the motion, seconded by Roger. Thank you. <laughs>